Alrighty. So careerism, again, going through Taleb. I love this one. I love, God, I loved the quote to kick this off. It's from Antifragile, of course. The best philosophers were not academics, but had another job. So their philosophy was not corrupted by careerism. <laughs> so he defines careerism as the debasing of knowledge by turning it into a competitive sport. It's, it's, I think it's a term. He didn't come up with the term. I, I've seen it introduced elsewhere. I was doing a bit of research. But I think it's basically where you pursue career metrics like advancement, power, and prestige, irrespective of like actual performance. And so we can think of it as like the game of the career for its for itself and like getting obsessed with the concept of your work and probably your status and hierarchy and things like that. Like someone who plays sport or sings for fame because they're generous, like genuinely interested in it and they just get obsessed with climbing the hierarchy for that thing. Whereas I think you always get more genuine kind of participation, fulfillment out of like if you're genuinely interested, of course. So I don't know, I, I'm big on this. I'm really big on this, Luke. Like I kind of scoff at people I consider to be careerists because I think they normally just get a bit detached from a healthier reality, if that makes sense. And I think it leads to a lot of mm. fat in society because I think that when when you're all in on one thing, which I understand it's like just the reality, like you normally got one key job, right? You want to focus on something. But I think the downside to that is that you are you obviously develop very easy to develop biases associated with that and we're talking a couple episodes about examples of people who run maybe institutions that have become very outdated it's like what are they going to do like just say no we need to like shut this down and start again like it's it's very very rare if if not non-existent because all your self-preservation biases sorry kind of pushing you in the other direction so i think that but i think the real all right i think the thing to draw attention to is when careerism and being too, I guess, insular or siloed in your thinking really constrains creativity and therefore your possibilities, potentially without you being aware. So I, for example, I can only really speak from my own experience, but I try and I don't really web myself to any single job title, right? And I find that incredibly, for me, I think it's very healthy. Like I first noticed the benefits of this when I was doing the nonprofit stuff because none of us were kind of full-time international development people necessarily. So instead of like trying to have some sort of international development charity career, it was just this thing we were incidentally doing, people like Scott and Nick. And we're also kind of mainly doing other things on the side. And what that does, the, there are obviously disadvantages to not being able to focus, but some of the advantages are normally creativity. And also, you're th you've got a broader set of possibilities you're, you're choosing from, All right? And I prefer to think of the world as a place, not where you try and find some job that you can, I guess, have succeed at. This is just my world view, world view. There's many ways of looking at the world, right? But I always, from that non-profit days, I love to reframe it as the world is full of these problems, places to add value, and experiences to create, right? In professional and personal contexts. And I like to respond to the things I care about, especially the problems. I'm definitely a big problem solver att or attempting problem solver. I don't know if I've actually solved any with the best tool within my toolkit, right? Or, and, or I need to work with the people who have that tool, like the best tool for this problem. So for example, I wasn't the builder, right? When we're doing from the ground up, Nick Abraham was the builder and he kind of got me to start helping him, right? Uh, or figure out, what if if it's, if something is beyond my current toolkit is it worth learning and growing into all right i've had to learn a bit more about website building for constant student it was worthwhile because it just made it easier and that's a small example right but also there's nothing that qualifies me to do like sorry there's so much that qualifies me but nothing uh, socially recognized let's say that really qualifies me to do any anything in education or even speak about it right i haven't really sought permission from anyone so it's, but I know that going down the journey will, will actually contain most of the learning I'll need to get whatever better, think better about it. So I don't know, for me, that's the way I kind of orientate myself towards things for better or for worse. But, you know, another application is even though writing is probably my favorite thing to do, I'm not purely a writer deliberately. I think there's financial constraints too. Obviously, like, and if all your if all the pressure is on the writing to make my income, 
then it puts probably pressure I don't want to have on the writing, which goes back to Taleb's point about philosophers. Like you can get a bit too attached when it's just that's the only thing you have. Whereas if you're a bit more diversified, you're not atta- you're, you're less likely to be attached to the things you're doing, like on an identity level, you know, or as deeply, which is, I think, I just think that there's this healthy midpoint in whatever you're doing between I am a writer and that is just the box I'm in. The negative is like, I could never write, you know, I'm not a creative person. You also don't want to be there. But there's health, this healthy place in between, whereas I think you're kind of somewhere on the spectrum for everything. But I think there is a danger with the whole careerism because you can become quite narrow-minded when you go down. Any echo chamber is an echo chamber, put it that way. So uh, I'll pause there because I've rambled a bit. Your option here, Luke, is if you have any thoughts on this subject, you're welcome to share them. I don't know if you have any. Not in particular. The only thing I could think of is when you're in a when you're in a sort of a more corporate um, environment, is trying to is trying to go for a specific title, which is like director mm. of sales, for example, and you're you're gunning for to get that position, but you're not actually exploring. Okay, what what underlies that? What makes me a good director of sales, for example? What are the individual mechanics? That's just the way example, I was thinking man. of That's it. That's a very good example because to... I think I'm not really, I haven't had that much experience on the corporate side of things. And I think that's an easy, I would, it seems like an easy trap to, to fall into, especially when it's more competitive. So, I mean, corporations by their nature, as, the, as they should, start to get more specific around roles. In a startup, it's only like you're doing a bit of everything. Mm. Like, what's the what's the job title? It's like, shut up, we got to build this thing before money runs out. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think if I can build on that just a tiny little bit more, a lot of salespeople put themselves into a box. Whereas you you see a lot of the most um, powerful people in an organization. Just in my experience, I haven't been in too many companies, but are those sort of I can think of one specific guy that's the most valuable almost in the company, and he started off as a, an apprentice, and he's worked in so many different elements of the business on the on the ground level and has built his skills up, and now he's a salesperson. But he started repairing phone systems, doing training sessions at companies. He's, he's touched every element, then he's done networking. Now he's in sales and he seems to be the most effective because he has the most practical and oh, widest that ranging skill range set. by uh, David Epstein, I think it is. He just talks about how there are more advantages than disadvantages to being multidisciplinary, to having a range of experiences that you draw on. He brings on examples like uh, uh, Van Gogh and, and from sporting examples like Federer versus... Some people have a narrow thing, like Tiger Woods was always a golfer, but it's because it was from like the age of three. It was like Roger Federer kind of played the field a bit more. He was good at a bunch of stuff. Nadal was, could have been a soccer player, chose tennis. But, you know, there's, there's some sort of benefit to the, the flexibility, I'm um, sorry, the, the range of experiences because it gives you a different lens at, of looking at something. Like I learned a lot about digital marketing, for example, but also investing from working in real estate. I apply investing principles to like every part of my life, including the work part of my life. It's why I love Taleb so much because I think when you're reading Taleb and you're thinking about education, if you're doing those two things uh, and career, you start to think about life more through an investing lens where it's all these different games and you got to choose which games you want to play and what the odds are and what's on offer there yeah. and what do I optimize for, which is kind of like it's very similar when you're just doing the conventional financial application of investing so diversity creates that diversity of experience is actually better for cultivating creativity whereas experts as like that book range identifies experts are great at replicating something over and over not necessarily coming up with something new right a surgeon Mm. you don't want a first-time surgeon ever you want someone who's done that surgery (laughs) 500 times because it's the same kind of, it's the same process. Whereas it's hard to actually have an expert entrepreneur, almost impossible. Because larger degree of randomness, it's always something creative, right? Just because you've done, Elon Musk's next, next company could be a complete dud, right? It could, could be a complete dud. No one knows. He's gone to the edge of bankruptcy like multiple times with um, SpaceX and 
I don't know, sorry, multiple times. I know the GFC in particular. It's not necessarily like just even yeah. if everything he's touched has worked, it doesn't mean the next thing will work. But he also, the advantage he, he does have, the thing, sorry to cut you off, the thing he can control for no, no, is we... he's had a whole range of experiences. He's got all these different use cases, situations in the past to, to draw on, but he still has to apply it well and it may not, still may not come off. I think very, very quickly, Charlie Munger has like, he goes Mental through a list models? of, and there's one, yeah, there's one that makes me think of this, which was, I think, yeah. man with the hammer syndrome. That's a big one. So it's very similar in, in the sense that, yeah, whenever someone has a strong reference for one particular skill set, they kind of look at every other facet of their life from that lens. And in a lot of cases, it doesn't apply. The same principles exactly. don't apply. And I think something you might fall into in your youth is not wanting to meander around a couple of different things that call to you because you feel like you've got to pick one thing and get ahead. And it can be a nice feeling to being maybe ahead of your peers. But again, it might be that whole risk seesaw thing um, because in, in the long run, you might be better served just following what you're interested in and ignoring the bullshit comparisons and the so-called where you should be by certain ages and all that stuff. That's a very good, I think, unpacking of careerism. Let's move on to the next big Taleb idea. 